you want? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You guys will have to pardon me. I have cold, so be a bit disturbing. My voice will not be clear sometimes, so bear with me. I'm starting the recording. <clears throat> okay, the meeting is getting recorded now. So I think uh, what we had discussed is uh, in fuel ignition electrical systems, we discussed the ignition system, the ignition timing, the centrifugal advance, and the vacuum advance mechanisms. Then we went, then, then we moved on to automotive electric and electronics. So there we saw different circuits uh, that we use. And then we discussed about the battery, right? After that, we moved on to generator and alternator, the difference between the two and why alternators are used in uh, modern vehicles, the current vehicles. Am I correct? what we have done, right? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so moving further, so there is something called as a starting circuit. The see the engine is not capable of self starting in the sense it has to be cranked up, right? So what do what did people do in very initial stages? How did they crank the engine? Because you know you have to set the engine in motion, right? <clears throat> the engine is stationary. Unless the engine is cranked up, unless it starts running. It won't continue the cycle. So, how did people crank the engine in very earlier days? Hello. You guys are not audible. Louder? Sir, uh, they used to tie a rope. Rope, okay. They used to and tie a rope. To pull, huh? They used to pull. They used to pull they... to start uh, the rotator motion. They used to pull to start the rotary motion. Okay. Any anything else have you seen? They there used to be a rotor in front of the car in olden times. Like hmm. a crank. Like a crank. Yeah, there is a cranking lever. So have you guys seen that in the IC engines lab? There is a cranking lever. It is attached to the engine shaft. And then they rotate it. A person will have to rotate it by hand, hand cranking, they call it hand cranking. Have you seen that? Yes, yes sir, I see. Yeah, hand cranking is very, very dangerous actually, because once the engine starts, if you leave the handle onto the shaft without pulling it out at the right time, the handle can be thrown out and it can be extremely injurious to people around. And also it is very effortful, Every time you have to crank and crank the engine, it's extremely effortful. So then people moved on to starter motor. What we have now is a starter motor. It's very powerful. You need very high torque. Imagine the engine is stationary. And if you have to start the engine, you need huge amounts of torque. Right? So this motor is called as the cranking motor. Right. So, 
the battery sends the current to the starter when the operator turns the ignition switch to start. So this causes the pinion gear in the starter to mesh with the teeth of the rear gear, thereby rotating the engine crankshaft for starting. We'll see some of the pictures of this. So you have a kickstarter in two wheelers, right? So the kickstarter is nothing but the same mechanism in the sense you provide an initial torque to turn the engine, turn on the engine, right? So you have to rotate the crankshaft and allow the piston to move up and down and start the engine by supplying fuel and the ignition. So this is a typical starter motor, very, very small motor. In fact, I can show this to you when we, if, if at all you get a chance to go to the automobile engineering lab. Otherwise, I'll conduct a video session probably where I can <clears throat> show you the starter motor, how it functions. Or you can even see some YouTube videos, I don't know, must be available. <clears throat> this is how it looks like. You see, this is the starter motor. You see a small pinion here. Are you seeing what I'm showing? A small pinion. Is visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pinion is extremely small gear. So this pinion is capable of moving front and back on this shaft. You're able to see the small shaft, right? So this pinion can move forward and backward on this shaft. And this pinion is basically operated by the motor. The pinion will rotate. At the same time, it can move forward and backwards like a spline, you know. It can move forward and backward. So there is a solenoid valve which pushes this pinion forward and then pulls it back. When does this push it forward? When the engine has to be started, what will happen when you turn on the ignition key and uh, when the starter motor is powered, what will happen? This solenoid valve will operate to push the pinion gear forward. When this pinion gear comes forward, you see this two small diagrams here. The pinion comes and engages with the, what is this ring gear? This is with the flywheel. Along with the flywheel, on the circumference of the flywheel, there is a ring gear. You are seeing the ring gear here? It's a large diameter gear. Yes, sir. So this pinion will come in contact with that ring gear. And the pinion rotates at high RPM, thereby rotating the flywheel ring gear, right? So then what happens? This allows, so when the flywheel ring gear rotates, what happens? The crankshaft rotates and the engine piston moves up and down and the engine gets cranked up with the uh, supply of fuel and then the ignition, the engine gets cranked up. So the moment engine gets cranked up, what will happen? The flywheel, now we are not providing power from the flywheel to the piston. Now the piston gets power from the power stroke. So what happens? The flywheel gets power from the engine and the flywheel starts to rotate at much higher RPM. So now immediately you have to pull back this pinion gear from the flywheel. Right? Otherwise the starter motor will get damaged, the pinion will get damaged. So initially while cranking, the pinion is made to come in contact with the flywheel ring gear. Once the engine is cranked up, the pinion is pulled back by the solenoid valve, right? So that way the engine gets cranked up. There are other mechanisms apart from solenoid valve, we can use other mechanisms for the, <clears throat> there is another mechanism because of higher RPM of pinion gear itself, the pinion gear moves back. So there is a thread mechanism. You can see there are different mechanisms, but what is important for you to note is, uh, the pinion has to be in contact with the flywheel ring gear during cranking. After cranking, it has to be pulled back. So it's a small motor, but it's a very powerful motor because it has to provide very high torque. The ignition circuit, I think already we have discussed this. Next is the lighting circuit. So lighting circuit, it includes the battery, vehicle frame, all the lights, vehicle frame, because the wiring goes through the vehicle frame, and also various switches which control their, it's also known as a single wire system because it uses the vehicle frame for the return. It uses only single wire. The return is done through the vehicle frame. The vehicle frame itself acts as the return line. So 
<coughs> if you look at so it's a typical light diagram you can say of a lighting circuit you can look at the details of it there is a stop light can you can you guys tell me some of the important lights in a automobile indicators headlights fog lights lights yes fog lights fog lights fog lights are they used in all the vehicles right now all vehicles have fog lights sir. really yeah okay then now what brake lights in the huh? brake lights behind brake the car lights. yes stop lights they call it brake lights stop lights the rear then parking lamps is the parking light correct then there is a cabin light every cabin has a light right for the uh rear trunk <clears throat> you have the uh you have a light for the front bonnet you have a light and the uh, inner cabin the passenger cabin has different lights correct so there are so many lights in an automobile and now <clears throat> there is ambient lights also to give a certain ambience within the vehicle they provide different lights so you guys have seen that Yes, yeah, they also provide a certain ambience within the vehicle with different colors and so on, right? So several lights are there. So, but the circuit is something which provides for provides power for all these lights for the various operations that are meant to provide lights within the automobile. What type of lamps are used? What type of bulbs are used in uh, automobile lights? Halogen. Halogen is a very popular one. Nowadays, I think they are switching to LEDs. Halogens were extremely popular, halogen lamps, because they were able to provide very high power. But now I think they have moved on to LEDs, right? <coughs> so initially, you know, I mean, small gas filled incandescent lamps with tungsten filaments were used. Like a regular lamp, <coughs> later on halogen lamps were used. The greater the candy bar of the lamp, the more current it requires to light it. And you guys know how many bulbs are there inside a headlight? Does anyone know? No, no, this is, let's say this is a typical headlight. Whether it's a two-wheeler or four-wheeler. In four-wheeler, you have front two headlights, right? Headlamps. And in two-wheeler, you have one. How many bulbs are there inside? Only one, one I guess, sir. Only one bulb. Uh -huh. Have you seen carefully? You guys are riding two wheelers so much. Why don't you take a look how many bulbs are there inside? Okay, this is a homework question. Tomorrow you tell me the answer. Okay. How many bulbs are there inside? I don't know. It can be one also. I'm not saying whether it is right or wrong now. I want you to check and then tell me tomorrow. Okay. Sir, so for older vehicles, they used to have two, sir, because one for low beam and one for high beam. But mm. later it has changed so that both the filaments are adjusted in one bulb only, sir. Really? Yes, sir, in few, you can see. Mm -hmm. Okay, check and tell me, Ajay. Okay. Low beam and high beam. Okay, since you brought up, I, I, actually, I want to ask you what is this low beam and high beam? What is low beam and high beam? Low beam means what? High beam means uh, the light projects downward, sir, in mm -hmm. front of the car. And high beam means uh, it it will project the light a uh, little bit far from the vehicle so that we can see ahead. How do they adjust it? Uh, yes, sir, and it is uh, adjusted also, sir. Uh, you can how? Have how? You have you have the dimmer switch, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Low beam, high beam switch you have, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, you, you you have that uh, distance no, changer also, sir. How how do they adjust it? How exactly the difference happens? Like a switch, sir. 
I know it's a switch. I'm asking what happens inside when you use the switch. Change the power output. Changing the power. No, if you change the power output, how is it that the distance traveled by the light is varied? Change in circuits. Change in there is a reflector back at the back of the bulb, sir. Okay. Maybe they change the only orientation of it. You change the orientation of the reflector. Sure. I don't know, I guess. Have you guys studied high school physics? Uh, in high school physics, have you guys studied about light and lenses? Mirrors and lenses? Yes, sir. You studied about mirrors and lenses. Okay, what type of a mirror is used in a, a headlamp or a headlamp? Concave. A concave mirror, right? Yes, sir. A concave mirror, where does it produce its reflection? In front of that uh, mirror part. I mean, if, I, if part. I position an image or if I position an object at the focal point of a concave mirror, where is the reflection formed? At infinity. infinity. At? Infinity, sir. At infinity. Correct? You guys are clear about that? So if I position an object at the focal point of a concave mirror, the image is formed at infinity. So what they do is for high beam, the lamp is more or less positioned in the focal point of the concave reflector. Now, what happens when you position it more or less at the focal point of the concave reflector? Where do you get where do you get the image? You get the image at farther distance. Farther distance. So <clears throat> what happens? How how do the rays, light rays travel from the concave mirror in such a case? Parallel to the axis. Parallel axis. axis. They travel parallel to each other. So they go larger distance. Now, if you carefully look into the bulb, uh, which is fixed uh, in the focal point of, I mean, the center of the concave reflector, there will be two filaments. Like Ajay said, there will be two filaments. One filament is closer to the focal point of the uh, concave mirror. The other filament is slightly away from the focal point of the concave mirror. So when you take it farther away from focal point, where does the image form? Where does the image form? Low beam, sir. Yeah, low beam. It forms forms slightly <clears throat> at a shorter distance. So low beam, high beam adjustment is simply done by operating two different filaments within the same bulb. So when you switch between low beam and high beam, high beam means the filament which is closer to the focal point gets powered up. And if you switch to low beam, one which is away from the focal point gets powered up. This is how low beam and high beam are varied in an automobile. <clears throat> are you guys clear about this? Yes, sir. Still, you have to tell me how many bulbs are there inside the headlamp. You guys check. Also, what you do, I think most of you guys have two wheelers, right, at home. You guys can, in the reactions, you tell me, you raise your hands and show me how many of you are having two wheelers at home. There is a reaction option in the website, and so you guys can raise it for your hands. Raising the hand is okay. So a reaction something, right? You can get thumbs up or something. Yes, I can see some reactions. Rebex is good. Some of these features you can use. So please go to your two-wheeler, look into the headlight and see how many bulbs are there and turn on the two-wheeler and then what you do, switch between high beam and low beam and see how the filaments are powered differently. Okay, will you do that? Please do that as a homework and remind me tomorrow. Okay? Okay, sir. So I have another question now. So some of you may also have four wheeler at home. Many of you may have, some of you may have, some of you may not have. But for those who have four wheelers at home who are 
Pune we also have the licensed drivers who will be driving four wheelers. Can you tell me how the two front headlamps are oriented? How are they oriented? Their axis intersects, sir. Are they oriented uh, straight so that uh, they will intersect at the center line of the vehicle or are they oriented slightly towards the right or are they oriented slightly towards the left? Yes, Ajay, you have raised your hand for this. <clears throat> Does anyone? How is it oriented? Anyone knows? Sir, I guess uh, that differs between high beam and low beam, sir. Hmm. High beam, what happens? High beam, uh, they will intersect at a farther point, sir. For low beam, they will be to right and to left, sir. If I'm right. Right and left. How can it keep changing? I mean, uh, the right headlight, uh, the orientation in filament, sir, I guess. No, no, I'm asking you, where do both the lights intersect? Do they intersect at the center line of the vehicle or towards the right or towards the left? Regardless of high beam, low beam. They spread apart, sir, like they more wider. Mm -hmm. Okay, that is also homework, okay? Check that and uh, let me know tomorrow. All right? Just give me a minute, I have to, one moment, I'll be back. Okay, so there are two homeworks that I've given. Check how many lamps are there inside the headlights and then uh, how are they oriented in a, uh, what do you call a four wheeler? Just check, okay? Just check and let me know. So <clears throat> you can read through the details, most of it I have discussed here. So there's also something called as blackout lighting, which is not very commonly used, but it's used in defense vehicles. You can read through it. That's also a very interesting <clears throat> topic. Yeah, the turn signal system, the indicator lamps, like we call the left, right, so on. Okay, have you guys been to RTO office for uh, getting license? Yes, How sir. You yes, sir. for a two wheeler or four wheeler? Two wheeler. Sir. Two wheeler. Okay, in two wheeler, when you turn left and when you turn right, what signal you have to show? Hand signals. How will you show? Yes. You turn, when you turn right, you have to like raise your hand towards the right. Correct. Towards the right. Yeah. Okay. And then towards left. Left. You have to rotate your okay. arms. When you turn left, you have to turn your arms. You have to again raise your hand towards the left. Is it? No. You have to turn your arms. Which Which arm? Right arm. Right arm. Why? Why so? How do you know this? 
because they told you in the RTO office. Hmm? Many of us may not know that even for turning left, you have to use your right arm and show that you are going to turn left by rotating your right arm. How many of you know this? How many of you don't know this? Okay, I'm giving you so many homeworks today. So tomorrow, let me know. If somebody knows the answer, you can tell me now. Otherwise, it's tomorrow. See, we are so far distanced from practical aspects of life. We don't know answers for these questions. Okay, but it's interesting. I also didn't know answers for many of them. <clears throat> but now, since we are learning this topic, we should know. Okay. So, let's come back tomorrow. You can also ask me questions. Don't think that only I am asking you questions and putting you on the spot. Let's say you have some questions to ask me. You ask me and I may not know the answer. Then you can tell me the answer later on. If it's an interesting thing related to automobile engineering. All right. So, then the class would be a little more interesting, I suppose. So we'll have so some are, are some of you noting down what I'm saying? Yes, sir. Okay, so that we can remind me all of these things tomorrow. So then we can discuss the answers for all these things. Okay. So then there is backup light system. There is stop light system, which is when you press the brake. Okay. So this is another. Way. Why do you need a brake light? The rear stop light. Why do you need a stop light in the rear? So that the relaxes the light the pass, I mean, like behind coming vehicles. Hmm. So that to alert them that you're applying a brake, you're decelerating and applying a brake, right? Okay. So you all knew that we never there is BS norms, right? Emission norms. BS norms. Right. Uh, all of you have heard about BS norms, emission norms. Come on, you guys don't know about BS norms. Yes, sir, for bikes. Yes, sir, for bikes. Yes, yes, sir. Bikes, even for four wheelers. So we never had a BS five. We had BS four, and then we moved on to BS six. Correct. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please keep track of these things. So, Bharat stage 4, we had Bharat stage 6. I think now we are in Bharat stage 6, BS6. So, in most of the BS6 vehicles, I mean, all the BS6 vehicles, there is one mandatory thing that they said should be implemented. <clears throat> I mean, with respect to the headlights, what was that? The headlights should be. Turn on in daytime also. Yes. Yeah, they should be always on. You never yes, had a switch to turn them off. They should be always on. Why? This is another question. Okay, so note down. Why? The simple answers. It will not take reduce time. accident, sir. Maybe. Why? How does it reduce accident? Uh, it might alert the. Uh, Powered vehicles, like which are coming in the opposite direction. How? Uh, the headlights, sir. I mean. Hmm. Yeah, you are right. You are right in one sense. It's true. But read the full detail, okay? Why it is kept on? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are right. I mean, I'm not saying you are wrong. But please read through the details of it. All right. Then we have emergency light system. Right? There are several gauges. There is something called as a battery conditioning gauge. Uh, battery conditioning gauge you can read. So next one is fuel gauge. This I would like to discuss uh, in detail. So this may take some time. Probably I'll discuss this uh, more. Okay, I'll take this up tomorrow. Are there any questions? 
So I think as far as WebEx is concerned, the attendance is automatically recorded. I don't have to separately ask you to do that. Uh, are there any questions? Yeah, any questions? <clears throat> Sorry, I'm not feeling so well. So, anyway, so if you guys have to leave, you can leave. The class is over. And those who want to stay back and uh, <clears throat> ask any questions, they can ask. Others can leave. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Sir, in ignition systems, uh, we talked about contact breaker and condenser, right? Uh, what is that? Sir, we talked about contact breaker and condenser. Contact breaker, yeah, condenser, yes. Uh, so, 